Hi, this is Les Posen, clinical psychologist, Flightwise Fear of Flying. We've entered now the second half of January 2019. The Australian Open Tennis has just started this week into very hot weather. Today is quite good, it's, it's only 27 centigrade, but we're expecting some quite hot weather coming, always is the case with the Australian Open. I want to continue my series to help people work through their fear of flying issues. We've looked historically uh, on these YouTube videos at uh, turbulence, at apps for predicting turbulence and whether they're, they offer you value. We've looked at the problem with using distraction to minimize your discomfort uh, when you anticipate you may be uh, in a difficult situation when it comes to flying. Not just flying, by the way, but any other situation which raises the hackles a little bit. And, and today I want to introduce you to what might be one of a series of, um, uh, of short videos where I want to talk to you about a, an important concept in behavioral change that's well known to psychologists. And if you pick up any book about fear of flying that's not been written by a pilot, but has been written with some, by someone who's got psychological skills and qualifications, um, it'll be called self-talk. Essentially, self-talk is our internal dialogue, as in when we look out the window and go, oh God, look at the weather. And you start to make predictions as to what your experience may be like on the drive to the airport, when the plane leaves the airport and makes its way to its destination. So we call the, this sort of self-talk also known as automatic thoughts. They are there almost as if they're sort of sitting just below the surface and he's just a minimal stimuli to sort of get them to the surface. But unfortunately, as you will know, they don't just sort of sit there and you go like a neon sign. Oh, look, the weather's going to be challenging today. They actually trigger a variety of sensations within us, which themselves can become uh, fraught with, with danger, shall we say. So oftentimes when I see someone for the first time, and sometimes even over the telephone, in order to decide whether it's a good thing for them to come and see me, one of the things I ask them for is information about how do they know that they've become anxious. And oftentimes they'll refer to not their automatic thoughts or their self-talk, that does happen every so often, but oftentimes they'll talk about their sensations, i.e. my heart starts to flutter or race. I get choky sensations. I break out in a sweat. My stomach turns in knots or I get butterflies. I go weak at the knees. I go really quiet. So these are some of the things I, I like to hear because there's some of the things that um, we need to work with. We need to understand why they there and if we can properly label them. Are they normal or is there something, are they really a signal of gross danger? Uh, and what are some of the things that we can do to not necessarily reduce them to zero, but to make them more manageable should they occur uh, over the course of one's flying career uh, to the point where if they do pop in, you sort of say to yourself, no, well, there we go again, but I know what they are. So self-talk is really quite important. In the work that I do, I often will show patients uh, how people who are truly in danger deal with these sensations and their self-talk. Um, most people who come to see me are aware that at some point they're not really in danger. And this is the situation where they became even more unhappy and miserable because I shouldn't be feeling this way. I know logically what's going on. I know it's safe, whatever it might be. And yet here's my body doing what it's doing and I don't seem to be able to control it and it's really interfering with me. Interfering to the point where if I have to fly, maybe I've got to take medication or alcohol or maybe I've got to fly the day before so I can be sure to recover for the nine o'clock meeting the next day, so forth and so on. I'm sure some of these stories are familiar to you. So one of the things that I do is show people how those people who, who for whom panic in their situation is really not very desirable go about training not to panic. And the sort of people that I focus on are those in special services uh, in the military uh, this work is kind of appealing to 16-year-old 
boys who come to see me because they really get into this. But for regular adults, we sort of move to one side about the military part of it, but into the training part of it. And what becomes very, what has become very clear to those in both military and the sporting field is that simply selecting people on the basis of their physical appearance and their strength and their stamina will only get you so far. It's a necessary condition, but to get to championship or elite levels of performance, it's insufficient. And you really can't judge a book by its cover. As long as you meet minimal fitness standards, um, you need something more to be able to perform at the, the most elite levels where you're going to survive a difficult mission, prevent harm or injury to your colleagues, or perform on the sporting <coughs> field um, with great acumen and skill. That's um, Scout, my uh, German shepherd co-therapist, having a bit of a bark, there's noise outside. Um, so, there are four things that we talk about when we look at how these special forces do their training. The first three that we work on are what's called top-down training. It's making use of the newest part of our brains in evolutionary terms, which is the prefrontal cortex, our frontal lobes up here, which seem to be about planning and interpretation of events, what's going on here, trying to explain to ourselves what's happening in order to make the correct decision. By definitions, it's sort of slow and, and somewhat ponderous. In opposition, so it would seem, to an earlier part of our brains, which my hairy friend who's sitting over there uh, happens to also to have, and that's the limbic system, the emotional center of the brain, so it would seem, and the areas of the brain which are most responsible for the determination of threat and what to do about threat, and that's the amygdala. Amygdala is ancient Greek for armament because the ancients named things by size and shape rather than purpose. We think that maybe the amygdala has really only become uh, known for what it's doing uh, in fairly recent times when you could actually uh, take dogs off the street as they were and, uh, and have surgery on them and put them back together again so they could survive the surgery and just see what happened if you mucked around with the amygdala. In human beings, um, there are natural experiments where people have been have had a tumor there removed plus part of the amygdala or there's a, a, a metabolic condition where the calcium that's produced as a result of, of activity within that area is simply not removed it builds up and then you start to get shrinkage of amygdala and you can start to see what happens in terms of people's threat and fear responses it's really quite interesting subject for another talk so three things that we do which are top down number one goal setting taking a difficult task and breaking it down into small manageable chunks and just working on that until it's finished and move to the next one if you're a teacher it's also known as scaffolding where you build a scaffold section by section by section if you teach dance or if you learn dance routines it's building up bit by bit so you master the first part practice with the next part that now becomes part of the first part so you now you've got one new big first part and you keep adding so it's like a scaffolding thing which is how you learn so that's goal setting and basically the whole task is for the frontal lobe to be able to tell the pesky amygdala the threat response system stand down at ease don't throw me into chaos i've got a plan as to what to do okay that's the the point of it number two is what we call visualization or rehearsal. Sometimes you can't get into a plane every day in practice. And so as you can see behind me, I've got my seats and my sort of airplane set up and we can practice doing things either using uh, YouTube videos or we can use virtual reality to practice doing certain things within the airplane environment or the aircraft uh, environment and, uh, and practice doing what I would suggest to patients is the right thing to do in a given set of circumstances. Third thing is the self-talk part. The way you frame or evaluate or appraise the situation using the words you have at your disposal can either set you off to go that way and make things even more intense unnecessarily, or you can head that way, not to, into calmness, but into self-management so you can reach those goals more readily. So that, those first three things are what's known as top-down 
kind of uh, interventions. Uh, goal setting, mental rehearsal or visualization, uh, and, and self-talk. The fourth one is what's called bottom-up, and that's trying to directly get to those things that, cr that create that sense of discomfort. Centers which are in control of respiration, heart rate, digestion, and the engine that drives those changes, the hydraulic system, if you like, and that's blood pressure. And that's centered at the back of the brain here in the brain stem, which we have in common, not just with my hairy friend, but with other animals at a much lower evolutionary level as well. And we need special techniques to try and tell that one to stand down at ease, to give the other three, goal setting, mental rehearsal, self-talk, a chance to get in. Self-talk, which is the one I want to focus on for the moment, uh, has been around as a, a, a therapeutic intervention probably since the 50s, 60s, and well and truly is the standard uh, which, which has been best tested empirically in the publications available to us that says if you can help people work on their self-talk and moderate and modify that, uh, you can take people a long way to overcoming their anxiety state. Okay, uh, we think that the success rate for the self-talk approach, also known by the way as cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, is somewhere between 80 and 95%. It's very high. Um, the difference sometimes being the quality of the relationship between patient and, and, uh, and therapist, uh, which can get you over the line from the 80 up to the 95. Um, those 80, 95 figures are more about not so much one-on-one -on -one work, but in group uh, work where there's a standard eight session or 16 session task that we go through over several months. Um, and that's where you get that, that sort of figure from. I would like to think that a one-to-one -one where you're really working very narrowly with someone on just their stuff, you actually can, should be able to get that rate a little bit higher. Um, so self-talk, put rather simply, is this, that our emotional states and our behavioral states are very much intertwined with how we think and evaluate the things happening around us. Oftentimes, we're unaware of the self-talk that sits just below the surface. And it's only when we're exposed, perhaps suddenly, rapidly, to a, uh, a situation that we become aware of our self-talk. And the task in therapy is to become, is to make that, that, that self-talk quite up there at the surface so we can actually work on it, challenge it where necessary with better facts not saying alternative facts, but a better explanation of what's going on both in the external world. What was that noise? Uh, uh, is the plane really falling? But also, what are my sensations? How come I'm feeling choking? And how come I'm feeling all upset in the stomach? We need to have words that will help to explain these concepts so people not just, not so much reducing these sensations, but at least accepting the sensations will be present um once these conditions uh, are apparent so for instance when i fly in with patients into launceston because it's often quite bumpy i might have to report to them well i might get a little bit motion sick because i'm prone to that um but i don't necessarily you know develop a, a significant fear of flying because of it nor do i develop for that matter a significant, a significant fear of throwing up i understand what's going on i purposely put myself in that situation uh, and there are things that I do to minimize uh, these reactions that I might have um, rather than saying, well, gee, how embarrassing would that be to, to get ill in front of a, a patient that I'm trying to help? Maybe I, I shouldn't fly with them, let them go on their own. Well, that's not going to serve us terribly well. One of the models I want to work with you uh, based on, uh, is based on this device here, which is uh, my iPhone. And those of you who've got a, a phone like this, I also have a, a Samsung, which I use for my virtual reality. It sits over here on its charger. Is that these new phones have got devices built in, which is, uh, which is like Siri. They're artificial agents that will listen for you. In the earlier iPhones, you had to press the home button. This is an iPhone 10. It doesn't have a home button. The whole screen is the home button, so to speak. Uh, but you just have to press a button down and that would bring up Siri, the agent who would say, what can I help you with? And you'd, you'd talk about what you needed. Um, 
with the newer ones, the ones that came after the introduction of Siri, um, you didn't have to hold the button down. You could actually, if they were plugged in, you could have Siri always on, ready to respond to you without you having to press down. The reason being that if it was powered up, you weren't wasting battery power with Siri sitting there always on in the background. And with these newer phones, uh, Siri is, is always available too because they've got really much better battery conservation now. So uh, if I say to it, hey Siri, you can see it pops up and says, what can I help you with? Okay. So that's what goes on. This happens not just with phones, it happens with my Mac here. And also on the side here, uh, I have Alexa on a, um, on a little echo down here. And so if I say, hey Alexa, what time is it here in Melbourne? This might answer your question. It is 12.05 p.m. in Melbourne. Did that answer your question? Thanks, Alexa. You're welcome. So that's how it works. Of course, this Alexa device is always plugged in, as, uh, and this one always has Siri on. What you've got to imagine is this, that within your brain, even when you sleep, there are devices which are constantly measuring what's going on. How much glucose is in your blood? Is your blood pressure within parameters? Is your body heat within a very fine range? And if things move outside of those parameters, your body has an automatic process of bringing it back into where it, sh it should be. This is why when you go to your doctor and you get various blood tests, they always put in a range rather than it's that much. There's always going to be this range. So the thermometer that I have built into my air condition, which is sitting up there, I might set it at 22.5 centigrade, but it's always hovering around, moving up and down. If it gets to 22.5, then it gets to 24, engine will kick in, brings it back down. If it goes through 22.5 and goes down to 20, it'll come back up again. So it's always moving around. The important thing with self-talk is, is to imagine that your Siri is always on in your brain. Siri for us is like the amygdala. So if you use expressions like, oh my God, you don't have to even finish the sentence. It's like saying, hey Siri, and your threat response system sits up and pays attention, waiting for the instruction. But you don't have to give it any more instructions. It's going to go out and just check out. It's going to go out and check out what's going on. So that's how that works. So you've got to be aware of if you say, oh my God, here we go again. You don't even have to finish the sentence. It's the same as saying, or I'm not saying the words because my sisters will jump up automatically. You have to change the wording to something else. So sometimes if I'm watching a, uh, a video on YouTube showing me how to get the best out of Alexa, um, it'll trigger someone on the video saying the word Alexa will trigger my little Alexa down there, okay, into, into action. These things are very easily triggered. And so one of the things we've got to do with self-talk is to be aware that our self-talk inadvertently, not with our immediate intention, can trigger our threat response system. And it's clearly a virtue in animals that wish to survive, that you don't want to hang around and say, well, maybe it's this and maybe it's, I don't know. Better to be safe than sorry. Better that your self-talk, oh my God, should trigger one of your four standard survival mechanisms when confronted by, by a potential threat before you figure out, am I really in danger? Those four responses, are fleeing or hiding in the midst of it because we've got language and we can predict the future using language that is by learning from the past you don't have to wait until you're in a scary situation to then leave it you can avoid a situation okay so as time goes on you can develop even more and more sophisticated avoidance routines one of the classic ones i saw was a ceo who helped his company develop 
a video conferencing facility so the whole country could use video conferencing they didn't fly anymore saved a lot of time and money but really it was about him not having to fly anymore but he got lots of praise okay um so fleeing or taking flight is one of the first things that we do and clearly to do that your heart rate has to go up your blood pressure has to go up you have to get hot at the surface because your muscles are going to be generating lots of energy and that's why once you say to yourself, oh my God, I've got to get out of here, you start to generate automatically a lot of these sensations. Number one. Number two, and often overlooked in favor of number three, which I'll get to in a moment, number two is freeze, where we just stop absolutely still, but we're not lax, we're very stiff. So blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up. We're gonna hold ourselves really stiff. <gasps> so think about going to a scary movie something happens and everyone goes ah. well actually not everyone half the audience goes ah. and the other half goes oh and they look away which is a flight reaction so freeze a lot of energy it makes sense to freeze as a final solution to being uh, not being someone's lunch a final effort do or die if you like that if i freeze and stay still then maybe that marauding animal will not see me because I'm not running, I'm not breathing, I'm not making a noise. And maybe he or she at some distance will not see me, but somebody else who says, oh my God, lion in the, in the, in the jungle, I'm gonna run, uh, there'll be lunch. Number four is fight. So oftentimes we hear flight and fight. I think fight is well and truly overrated for human beings. Uh, as a primary thing it's good for animals like my hairy friend and for rats in whom the basic biological studies of the threat response were done in the 30s and 40s and hence flight and fight because that's what they do um, they do have a freeze reaction but in human beings it's far more pronounced than it is in these other animals they think of rabbits and deer at the waterhole and it's freeze they're not fighters as such so what have you got so far flight freeze fight fight can also be aggressive verbally you see a child running towards the road clearly not aware of the danger hey come back here raise your voice very aggressively in order to send a strong signal to make that child stop in their tracks freeze response and the fourth one is appease a-p-p-e-a-s-e -E -E, appease which is just to use language or your body to just convey a message to a third party or to another person or creature out there that says I'm not a threat so those of you who've got dog owners you take your nice big hairy dog down to the, the park another little dog comes running up perhaps a little bit junior and a little bit more timid and as soon as it smells or gets near your dog your soul's flattened its back and just exposes itself like this which is an appeasement gesture which basically says to the, the bigger stronger maybe more mature dog I'm no threat to you and exposes their there themselves you know i'm no threat to you don't waste your energy on me i'm not not much here so that's appeasing and we think that human beings also use appeasing in the way we look make ourselves small or look like this uh, or maybe try and talk somebody down uh, with uh, with appeasing okay so this is some something to do with the self-talk and what we've got to do is have a look at the self-talk that underlies uh freeze and fleeing and if you give yourself these directions oh my god as your first port of call your first automatic thought you will be generating a whole series of automatic behavioral activations or automatic reactions to your siri-like call out to the part of your brain that's always on always radar like checking out the environment external and internal for the presence of threat and or danger so that's the start to self-talk and in the next uh, video i'll tell you more about uh, some of the ways to acknowledge and then to challenge some of this self-talk and then to put that in action no matter what your anxiety state is i'll focus on flying but you'll see easily how well it can be used uh, in other domains where you might be experiencing these anxious reactions so stay tuned for that one it won't be very far away uh, in, in in january bye for now